if I had to like sum it up in a sentence or two, it would be don't diet. The, the diet backfires. It doesn't work. It makes it harder, not easier. Focus on health and the weight will take care of itself. Focus on real food. Learn to love vegetables. Learn to cook. Be active because it's fun and the rest of it will take care of itself. And so here we had this dilemma, this, this fact. fact. I spent almost a decade researching this subject. From the Hint offices in San Francisco, I'm Kara Golden. Every aspect of your metabolic health improves. Each week, we're talking to innovators and game changers who think outside the box and tackle problems that few address. What does it really take to be unstoppable? Let's find out. Super excited to have Daria Rose here with us in a little bit. She's the author of Foodist and also the uh, owner of summertomato.com website, if you want to see more about her. Very, very excited to have her here. Time Magazine had named Daria Rose's web blog, Summer Tomato, as one of the 50 websites that make the web great. Most interesting thing about Daria Rose, well, I should say one of the most interesting things for me is that she actually started down a path of getting her uh, PhD in neuroscience and completed that, but then decided that what she was seeing in her own life was really interesting to her, which was that she was doing a ton of dieting and it wasn't necessarily working. So she really decided she wanted to focus on real food aspect and understand how to actually solve some of her own problems and ultimately help other people solve their problems by really getting into real food versus using drugs and other kind of pharmaceutical stuff to solve the problems. So very excited to have her here today and learn more about what's inside and what she sees is going on. Daria Rose, so excited to have you here. Really, really psyched. Thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Very, very exciting. So everybody, as I told you earlier today, uh, Daria is the author of Foodist and also has a great site called summertomato.com, which really talks about getting healthy without dieting. And we're super, super excited to have her. As I mentioned, in addition to having this great site, she's also a neuroscientist and also named by Time Magazine as having one of the 50 websites that makes the web great. Anyway, we're very, very excited to have you here. So I'd love to just jump in and, and really ask you, like, so what was sort of the key to really starting your site? And, and what were you thinking about? What is some of your background and your story as to how you sort of got there? Well, I mean, if we're starting at the, the real beginning, it goes back into where I grew up in Southern California, I was, you know, a young woman. And my mother was a chronic dieter, as most women were back in the 80s. And but my mom was pretty, pretty extreme. And, and she did all the diets. And so at a very young age, I got into dieting. And this is not because I was overweight. I was I was a normal skinny kid from the 80s. Um, but you know, my mom was having chocolate milkshakes for breakfast. And that sounded awesome to an 11 year old. <laughs> so, right. you know, there were like the nasty diet ones, but I didn't really have a refined palate back then. And um, so I just kind of got on this path of having swim fast in the morning, which is kind of gross. And, um, and then as I got older and became more self conscious, it just sort of became a way of life. And I thought that that's just what women did. You know, women just diet. But, what they're supposed to do. <laughs> so, let's yeah. so I went through all that through middle school, high school, college. At some point, though, I did start studying science, specifically um, molecular biology and you know biochemistry and stuff like that. And I actually started learning things about the human body and about nutrition. And specifically, I got into neuroscience. And then I ended up going on and doing my um, doctorate in neuroscience. And throughout the whole process, I was still dieting. And, you know, I got better at it. I'd say I got like more like scientific about it. I would, you know, I would do the low carb thing. I've done the low fat thing. And then I was like counting specific kinds of carbs and specific kinds of fats. And, but it was still always a diet. And I was exercising like a maniac. I was running marathons, but I always still felt like I had weight to lose. I wasn't happy. I was fairly miserable in 
like social situations and like, all the time. Like, I mean, it's just a, it's a really not an awesome way of life. And, and then I figured it out. <laughs> I, I realized that I was a scientist now. Started digging into the literature and learned that diets are actually a better way to gain weight than to lose weight, <laughs> which of course I'd been doing for 15 years. So it was really frustrating, but at the same time, like matched my experience like right on. And that the people who really don't struggle with this stuff never diet. They just have like a set of habits around health and balance and they don't really think about it. I also read Michael Pollan's work and I was like, you know what, I'm going to try this wacky eating vegetables and cooking at home thing. And worst case scenario, I can just, you know, not eat for a couple of weeks and get back to my weight if I gain a bunch of weight by like eating breakfast. So that was sort of my like totally embarrassing, but true story of sort of like starting on my approach. And to my surprise and delight, I didn't gain weight from like eating more and focusing on health and cooking and doing all this stuff that I, you know, I just basically ate, lived on like protein bars and like non-fat cottage cheese for years. <laughs> um, and I, not only did I not gain weight, I started losing weight, like super slowly, but like, like noticeably. And I wasn't angry and hungry anymore. And I was eating things that actually tasted good. And one thing led to another, you know, so I started out just sort of trying to cook more at home. Then I like discovered the farmer's market and I discovered like, like all these amazing all this amazing produce. Then I, you know, I was like, well, maybe I don't need to have diet Coke anymore. And maybe I don't need to eat like box fiber one cereal anymore. And, you know, I started just getting off the fake health food train and getting on the actual real food train. And the more I did, the better my results got and the happier I was and the more I lost weight. And like, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> it was like the most amazing thing. And to be perfectly frank about this, like my life got so much better that the weight loss became just a bonus. Uh, just the fact that I wasn't miserable anymore was so life-changing. And, you know, when I looked at what was happening to me and I looked at the normal diet advice that I was given and that everybody else was still following, I was just <laughs> incredibly angry, I would say. <laughs> like, like, I was like, why are we being told the wrong thing? And we pay for it. You know, we, we buy books, we, we buy these products and they're, they're not helping, they're making it worse. And so I felt like I, I felt like a social responsibility to start a blog and tell people my story and set the record straight. And so that's how Summer Tomato started in my like third year of grad school, I think, something like that. <laughs> yeah, and the rest is history, you might say. Wow. We have a very, very similar sort of reason for kind of doing what we're doing because I had a very similar, although I wasn't uh, – necessarily uh, formally dieting. I drank diet soda and a lot of it and then found that just by giving up the diet soda and drinking plain water, even though I thought it was boring, I started to lose a lot of weight. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm not drinking diet anymore. So why am I losing weight? And then, you know, I talk about that a lot, that the reason why I started Hint was just because I was angry. Like, I was just like, how had I been <laughs> fooled for so many years by, you know, this industry around food and kind of what we were, you know, what I had been told. And, you know, I was a smart person who had been educated. And then I thought, like, here I was listening to terms like low fat and diet. And I probably had a slim fast somewhere along the way years ago okay. and thought like by doing that, I would actually get healthier. And it was sort of the reverse of that. So that's awesome that you, you know, were, were smart enough, frankly, to really look at it from a, you know, what's really working and how do I actually, you know, help people by sharing this information. So I always tell entrepreneurs, too, that there's nothing wrong with telling your own story because I think that people remember things by storytelling, right? And so if they hear that a founder actually has a story and a reason and a why, then it just is that much more valuable. Yeah, I would actually add that that's actually critically important to have a real story and to share it because kind of like what you hinted at, like that's the way people learn. Um, I mean, I study, what I really study now is psychology and behavior change and intellectual facts don't change people's behavior, but a good story will. Yeah, no, absolutely. And whether or not people- it has to do at emotional level, yeah. Yeah. And whether or not people actually, you know, look exactly how you look, they pick up on things that you're talking about in your story that they can relate to. So 
I, I mm-hmm. always hear that. And, um, but that's awesome. Like kudos to you for actually bringing this into, you know, a site where people can sort of hear your story and really figure out in their own way how to actually get health as well. That's super great. So what are your thoughts just in terms of what people are really trying to do? Is it weight loss? Is it, what's sort of the key things that you hear people talking about when they think about health? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a rich tapestry of pain. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So weight loss tends to be the focus and that's one of the reasons I kind of have it front and center on my website, even though, like I said, it's a bonus of sort of doing the things I I recommend is you tend to lose weight, but people get very focused on it. And that's largely because our society is very focused on it. Doctors are focused on it. And, and obviously there's also just the social pressure to look a certain way. But at the end of the day, the truth is that people want to feel better. They either want to lose weight because they're tired or they're worried about some disease or because they feel insecure about how they look. And at the, you know, the, the outcome of all that is if I change some, this thing about my body, then I'll, I'll feel better about the world, about myself. And um, tapping into that is, it's sort of subtle, but I, you know, I, it's one of the things that I, I, that's what I'm listening for. When I'm listening to somebody tell me their story of, of the, what they're struggling with from a health perspective, I'm trying to understand, like, well, what are you really trying to feel here? Yeah, definitely. And so you've got, like, would you say that the majority of people that are coming to your site relate to the whole concept of being a chronic dieter? Is that what you hear people talking about? Or, like, what is the key things that people see? I mean, you you also talk about just the relationship between neuroscience and food or health, like what are people really like identifying with in, in summer tomato.com? Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much everybody that comes to my site or like a huge percentage has been very frustrated by diet. They feel like they've tried everything. And this, and this goes from very young, you know, people in their twenties to, you know, like my mom, like people in their like late sixties, early seventies that have been dealing with this stuff for their entire lives and don't understand and are really upset that it's still not working for them. Yeah. So when I tell people that like, this isn't your fault, that you've been given a faulty method that you can, you can still be healthy. It all is not lost. You're not genetically flawed. Um, It's a, you know, it's a, it's a new thing. Maybe most people have never heard that before. And they love the idea of being gentle and compassionate with yourself and eating food that tastes good, just focusing on food that actually nourishes your body. So it's really a very different approach. I mean, when you think about dieting, it's a very like restrictive, self-loathing way to live. You know, you're like, I'm broken. Whereas I'm saying, you deserve to be happy. You deserve to eat food you like. You deserve to be healthy and you can have all these things. So let's, you know, focus on what you can do and and get off this this roller coaster that isn't doing anything good for you. And so people, you know, really obviously that resonates with people because they don't want they're sick of it. They're 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 over it, like I was. Yeah. Definitely. It's, it's interesting. I mean, today we're looking at sort of the political arena and things like, you know, Obamacare and, you know, what's happening with that. And I feel like the, the quick response from people today is, oh my gosh, you know, if we change, you know, to Obamacare or away from Obamacare or whatever, that um, I'm not going to be able to get you know, my drugs or prescriptions that I really need. And I feel like the consumer has been kind of hooked on on that approach to date versus like if we could actually get people to start to ask, you know, their doctors the questions like, is it possible for me to start to move off of these drugs that are maybe going to cost me more money? And how do we actually, you know, look at disease today from a nutrition perspective perspective versus, you know, focusing on drugs. I know you had said in some quote that I read, the answer to disease isn't sugary or drugs, it's food. Um, I'd love to sort of hear you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that. Yeah, you know, it it breaks my heart to to think that what I know (laughs) about 
the system. Um, doctors have about two hours of nutrition training in their entire medical training, like through all of med school and residency. They don't know anything about it. They, they don't like asking your doctor, unless it's, this, I mean, there are doctors and, and it's, it's becoming more common where doctors are realizing they need to know this stuff. But like, if they're doing, if they know that stuff, they've done it on their own. They weren't yep. trained to do it. Um, and that's commendable if they've done that. But that's not like an option sometimes. Like they just don't know. They'll just be like, well, they actually, there's a, there's a, I hear this a lot is a lot of patients assume to, or say that their doctors assume that they can't change their behavior. They're like, yes, sure. Losing 40 pounds and clear up your sleep apnea, but we know you can't do that. So here's some drugs. <laughs> and it's really disheartening. So what, the reason I got started focusing more from a health perspective and a science perspective on food as opposed to what I was doing before is because I was interested in neurodegenerative diseases, you know, things like Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease. And, you know, I just think these are tragic diseases. And the more I, well, I, there's no cures for any of these. And that's just depressing. You know, it's like it doesn't yeah. make you want to be a doctor because you just have to tell people bad things all day and that you can't do anything about it. Um, the, but like, I, I realized that like, those diseases, not to mention the, the obvious ones, um, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, the vast majority of the causes of misery in the disease, old age disease world are things that are massively improved if you eat more vegetables, eat less junk food, and exercise. Like, it's li these are lifestyle diseases. Ma like, the overwhelming majority. Obviously, there are real diseases, too. <laughs> but, like, yeah. these are, like... These are like things you could modify with your behavior. You could never get them. Like that's an option. And that just blew my mind. Like I thought cancer was random. Yeah. And to some extent it is, but like you can massively reduce your cancer risk. It's cancer that they don't know what caused it. You know, it's not an obvious genetic thing. Massively reduce your risk by eating more vegetables and exercising. Yeah, that's no, crazy. absolutely. Yeah, no, there was just a study <laughs> that came out a couple of weeks ago around dementia and Alzheimer's and, and how sweeteners are actually not just sugar, but also diet sweeteners are tied to, uh, to dementia and Alzheimer's outcome. And so they're saying that even if, you know, you have the genetics that say that you're probably going to get those one of those diseases that you may actually get it faster if you are living a life of eating sweeteners every single day. So as much as three times faster. So it's, it's fascinating how what you put into your body can actually greatly affect. So I just saw actually a bar graph on it and I was just like blown away that said that like, mm -hmm. if you are actually eating sweeteners, which I was on the track of sort of getting there at age, like you know, starting at age 10 or 12, these diet sweeteners, if you continue to do that by the time you're, you know, 40, you're going to show up with, you know, pretty solid dementia and Alzheimer's if you're like living the life on the course that I was living. So, so anyway, I think it's, yeah. it's, again, if you've got the genetics for it, which, you know, frankly, a lot of us do. So, so anyway, I think it's just really, really fascinating how just making those small changes. So is, you know, more than anything else. So like hydration, I mean, yeah. obviously, you know, hydration is so key to so many diets and plans that are out there. What is your feeling about, you know, just water consumption and kind of how that affects how people live and breathe every day? Yeah, I mean, it's important. I mean, a lot, one, of the, the, one of the biggest reasons is that a lot of people confuse thirst for hunger. And so, you know, if you're like, well, I'm hungry, I want a snack, there, there's a really good chance if you drink a glass of water, you'll not be hungry anymore yeah um but it also another another factor is like water just doesn't just come from a glass like the more vegetables you eat the less you know water you need to drink and the more fruit you eat the less water you need to drink so there's a balance there and and the science there's the science is actually really not very clear on how much water you need to drink but like you know it's interesting like what you said sort of about the science and the you know this new thing about the sweeteners and one of the things that like it just consistently happens and it's like we don't have answers to all the science like do we know why sweeteners are like linked to dementia like not really you know do we know why processed food is like 
cause all these problems? No, not necessarily. Like with there's theories, you know, there's like theories of, or, or everywhere. But what it, what at the end of the day, the re- the recommendations are always the same. It's like eat real food, drink real drinks, like right. stay away from the junk, and you'll like ninety five to ninety eight percent of the time be on the right side of the science study. Yeah, it you can't know, it's hurt. like oh, I already do that. Or yeah. like, I'm good. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So you've lived on both coasts. I know you went to school out here in San Francisco where we're based, but I'm so curious. So you're living on the East Coast now and you've lived in both places. How do you feel these two cities are different in terms of diet? <laughs> They're very different. You're going to get the, me in trouble with this the load. <laughs> I know. I I'm not going to say what city you actually live in, though, because I, uh, I, I'm very fond of that city, so I don't want any, any uh, of those people from that place that has two baseball teams. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody knows, everybody knows where I live. Um, I'm actually moving. I, I've lived in um, Manhattan and Brooklyn for the last few years, but I'm moving back to San Francisco in a few weeks. Yeah, no, it's a very different vibe for sure. I mean, it's, it's New Yorkers are very, um, they're very body conscious and there's not the same, I'm trying to like, I've, I've been like trying to figure this out for years because it was super interesting to like move to the, to, from the West Coast to the East Coast, especially from San Francisco, which is like so farmer's market centric. And for me, I think the biggest difference, the Bay Area specifically about where food comes from like, it's not enough that it's just not fattening. <laughs> yeah. You know, it needs to be um, organic and it needs to be seasonal and it needs to be, you know, grown from like heirloom seeds. <laughs> and like, and that's sort of everywhere. Like, it's like at any halfway decent restaurant, like they're going to have some of that ethos on the menu. Yeah. Um, and that's just not as true in the East Coast. And it could just be that there's not, the farms are not the same. Like the, obviously the farmland in California is just like incredible. And we, we have access to a lot more produce. And so it can be more f- focused on the menu without, you know, a huge cost. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was, it was a tough transition for me <laughs> for sure, because I'm just used to being able to pop down on any corner market and getting incredible produce that is in season. And pretty much the best I could do in New York was like, you know, one of the high-end organic grocery stores, like Whole Foods or something like that. Yeah, no, I I definitely uh, felt the same way. So I didn't grow up in California. I grew up in Arizona, where in many, many ways, uh, very similar to California in terms of, you know, lots of produce and, and lots of healthier and, you know, using different seasonings in order to get food and flavor to really be what you want it to be. And, and I found that when I moved to New York too, that it was, uh, it was challenging. I think it's gotten better, but it's funny. My, my day job, as you know, is, is the founder of Hint. And it's, it's interesting because at, whenever I run into people and they're like, oh, where are you guys based? And I say, San Francisco. And they're like, oh, of course you are. You know, because they know that <laughs> San Francisco is really, you know, the foodie capital of the world. It's it's always the joke is it's hard to find a bad restaurant in San Francisco and people are really focused on, you know, better for you, healthier for you food. So it's a great place. But I do love both cities and they both have, you know, lots of great aspects about it. But really, really. Absolutely. Uh, and there, I should mention that there are a lot of great chefs in New York. It's just the, it's the produce that's not there. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think that's. I think that's right. So, but I, I remember when uh, Whole Foods went into New York not too long ago, and it was like the thinking was, I'm not sure that this market could survive in New York. And it was, uh, <laughs> wow. yeah, I mean, it was really interesting. And today, you know, I think that they've really changed grocery landscape, not just in certain cities, but in every city, just by really getting consumers more and more aware of what they're putting into their bodies. And this isn't an advertisement at all for Whole Foods, but I'm just saying just in general, (laughs) like these healthier and better for you markets are really what people want no matter where they live. So yeah, and you do learn to appreciate it in in a market that doesn't have the sort of, you know, the farm centric place. I mean, I, I, I was so grateful for the Whole Foods in New York because I just I didn't know where else to shop where I could where I was sure I could get like organic food you know yeah it Defin- tasted good <laughs> definitely definitely so what I'm curious this is sort of a, a totally different question but I'm the mother of four kids but I have uh, three in high school now and I you know 
am always concerned when I talk to my daughters and also their friends about diet. And, you know, diet is something that especially teenage girls, I think, are very, very aware of. And obviously, there's lots of studies around being too focused on being too skinny. And and so, you know, what would you tell yourself, like knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself, your high school age self about, you know, diet and what they should really be focused on? Oh, gosh. It's so funny. I, I used to say this a lot, actually, is that summer tomato signs to be sort of a journal or, or letter to my 17-year-old self, because I think 17 was the worst of it. I was, I was so skinny and so miserable. I, I think, like, if I had to, like, sum it up in a sentence or two, it would be, don't diet. The, the diet backfires. It doesn't work. It makes it harder, not easier. Um, focus on health and the weight will take care of itself. Focus on real food, learn to love vegetables, learn to cook, um, be active because it's fun and, um, and, and the rest of it will take care of itself. At this point, I feel like so many, myself and so many of the people I work with, it's like the challenge right now is, is it's not so much, uh, that like, it's so hard to like stay healthy. Um, it's more that like we're un- we have to undo all the damage we've done by dieting for a decade or two. And, you know, if I could have avoided that, I, I would pay anything to have not gone through that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And all I had to do was go buy vegetables. Oh, yeah. it breaks my heart. Yeah. But nobody's really talking to teens about that. And I think it's, it's always, I look at you know, talking to other mothers about it too. And I really think it's, it's like, I talked to so many people who have been through it and, you know, sort of looking back in time, what they wish they would have known. So I think that's great advice is, you know, better for you, food, learning to cook, really understanding, you know, what they're actually putting into their bodies is really, really key versus actually focusing on calories and diet, and which, you know, really creates that yo-yo effect. So, so this is super exciting. Yeah. I'm going to send everybody to summertomato.com and, and also to go get your book at the foodist book, which is super great. Is there anything else you want to tell our listeners today? I have a podcast as well. If these are podcast listeners, they yeah. have like uh, my podcast is called foodist as well. Awesome. That's super great. I'm very, very excited. So good. Well, thanks again, Daria, and good luck with the move back to San Francisco. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. You can learn more about Daria Rose and her book, Foodist, at summertomato.com. Thanks so much for listening to Unstoppable. If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at karagolden.com. Until next time, be unstoppable. Addictive nature of modern food. Of course, it's important. Obesity and diabetes epidemic. <laughs>